So, salam alaikum again, everyone. Um, I know I know everyone here, but I'm Ali, Ali Reza, or Ali from San Jose. I want to talk about um, the Quran uh, today being easy to learn. Um, actually, I should probably grab my notes. I'm not that confident. <laughs> I do have the clicker. Thank you. So... Here we go. Actually, I want to read, I want to read an excerpt from uh, an article that, um, that I read online, and I uh, want you guys to think about what this means. So this guy um, picked up the Quran and tried to read it, OK? And this is what he had to say about the Quran. He said, when I first tried to read the Quran, I found it almost impossible, okay? And I'm a good reader. My reading comprehension has been tested, and it is very high. Um, yet I found my standard Quran confusing and frustrating to read, okay? Um, whether it was done intentionally or not, the message written in the Quran has been made difficult to sort out. And that discourages almost all non-Muslims and a significant percentage of Muslims from reading it. So I want to talk about why it is that this is actually a very common misconception about the Quran. Um, so, so most people think, if you go and talk, even, uh, I'm not, I'm not, limiting this to like Muslims or non-Muslims, like even Muslim people that you, that you talk to about the Quran will tell you um, the Quran is complicated, the Quran cannot be translated, um, they'll tell you um, the English, Arabic, or any other language that you may be referring to, translation of the Quran is difficult. Uh, they'll tell you, and then they'll tell you that there's actually many, many different interpretations of the Quran um, that are all correct. And, uh, and that's why it's so hard, because, um, because none of us are actually qualified to interpret the Quran. So let's look at what God says and, uh, and see if this is actually, if this is the truth. Is this what God tells us about his final scripture? So they came up with something called tafsir. Tafsir is just the Arabic word for um, interpretation. And, um, and, the, and this is from Wikipedia. So the basic definition of taf tafsir is just the, an attempt to provide elucidation, explanation, interpretation uh, uh, for clear understanding um, of the Quran. So what, what do they say about tafsir? About tafsir, they say, and this is from another uh, Islamic source now, quote unquote, tafsir is essential for proper understanding of the Quran. Uh, without knowledge of tafsir, we can't understand the meaning of the Quran. Tafsir is meant to explain to mankind the book that has been revealed to them by God. A person specialized in the Quran tafsir, we'll be better able to understand the intended meanings of a verse and derive rulings from it as compared to the average believer. So these falsehoods that have crept into um, the sort of the mainstream narrative here, what is the purpose of this, right? I mean, why is it that Satan would convince so many people that this book is extremely difficult? That it's, um, what, did, what did the guy say? He said, um, almost impossible to understand. <laughs> that it's uh, confusing, right? Why is it that, they, that, that Satan has convinced so many people that this is the case? Let's take a look now at uh, what God says in the Quran. God says, we made the Quran easy to learn. 
does any of you wish to learn? That's in Surah 54, uh, four times, and it's repeated word for word that way. And you can look up these verses um, yourself. I, I don't have enough time to read all of them. But, um, but God also says the Quran is perfectly clear. Okay? This is a direct quote. Perfectly clear. God says that the Quran is proven, that it's fully detailed, that it's flawless, and that there is no contradiction in the Quran. So if I told you that, that there was a book that you could read that was easy to learn, it was perfectly clear, it was fully detailed and flawless, would you call it confusing? You wouldn't, right? So here's what God says in Surah 3, verse 7, um, about the Quran. I seek refuge in God from Satan the rejected. He sent down to you this scripture containing straightforward verses, which constitute the essence of the scripture, as well as multiple meaning or allegorical verses. Those who harbor doubts in their hearts will pursue the multiple meaning verses to, to create confusion and to extricate a certain meaning. None knows the true meaning thereof except God and those well-founded in knowledge. They say, we believe in this. All of it comes from our Lord. Only those who possess intelligence will take heed. So, the first thing that I, um, I thought about is, how do I talk about the Quran when I present the Quran to other people? If I give the Quran to somebody, do I tell them it's difficult? Do I, do I, try, do I imply that um, it's, uh, it's not perfectly clear? Am I perpetuating this myth that, the, that Satan has, um, has created and put into the minds of, of so many people? Or do I say that the Quran is easy to learn and perfectly clear, like God says? And what is the essence of the scripture that God says it, it is uh, straightforward verses? What is that? The essence of the scripture is the things that are required for our salvation, Commandments, laws, prohibitions. One of the other names for the Quran is the statute book. So I ask you, is there such a thing as a multiple meaning commandment? Can you say that this is a commandment from God and it has multiple meanings? Um, is there a prohibition that can have multiple meanings? Is there such a thing? No. So God is telling us that the essence of the scripture is straightforward verses and, um, and that these commandments, prohibitions, rights, the things that are necessary for our salvation, they're all straightforward and they're easy to learn. This was an interesting um, discussion we had. Eunice uh, was at my house one day. We were we were talking about a Quranic subject, and uh, we, we, I think we read this verse. It says, we have cited for the people every kind of example in this Quran that they may take heed, an Arabic Quran without any ambiguity, that they may be righteous. And he, and he actually went and looked up the definition of ambiguity or ambiguous. And he found something interesting in the dictionary. It says, this is the first definition open to having several possible meanings or interpretations, okay? This is literally what, what the traditional Muslims say about the Quran. They say, the Quran has several possible meanings and interpretations, and none of us are qualified to know them, okay? And, and I think, the, you know, if you look deeply at kind of like the big picture here that Satan is, um, as a temporary god in this world, attempting to, uh, what his objective is, right? He knows that this, uh, that this scripture guides to the truth. So his objective is to prevent as many people as he can from reading it and to convince them that it's, that it's difficult, that it's uh, confusing, that they can't read it themselves, they need somebody to interpret it for them, okay? Um, but the other thing he wants to convince people of is that 
um, you can actually never be sure what the Quran means because the Quran has several possible meanings or interpretations, right? Uh, and that, now when we look back at that verse that God put in the Quran, God is telling us that there is no ambiguity in the Quran, which means, what does that mean? There's only one correct interpretation of the Quran. So that one correct interpretation of the Quran has a name, and it's called the truth. Okay? So the Quran is the truth, and there's one correct interpretation of the Quran. And, um, and this is one of the other reasons why God says in Surah 6, verse 73, that his word is the absolute truth. Can you look at something uh, and say there are, say, multiple different definitions of the truth? If I, if I show you 2 plus 2, could you say, in my opinion, it's 5, and then another guy says, in my opinion, it's 3, and we're both right? You can't say that, right? So, so there aren't 100 correct interpretations of the Quran. There's only one. And God says in 39, 33, Quran is the absolute truth. As for those who promote the truth and believe therein, they are the righteous. Here we go. Let's look at the verses. Let's see if there's any room for confusion or difficulty here. We have sent down to you such clear revelations, and only the wicked will reject them. 299. 2185. Ramadan is the month during which the Quran was revealed, providing guidance for the people, clear teachings, and the statute book. Clear delivery of the message. Not just the message itself, but God's messenger had a mission, and his mission was clear delivery. Clear revelations. Perfectly clear. 46.7. Okay? So this is how God describes the Quran. And then you compare this with the way that the Muslims, who are the self-appointed uh, custodians of Islam describe the Quran, right? And you look at the difference and you ask yourself, um, who, you know, are these two things in, a, uh, in agreement? So who is the teacher of the Quran? We all remember this verse, Surah 55, verse 2, where God says that uh, he's, the, he's, he's the only teacher of the Quran. Okay? And who explains the Quran? God says he explains the Quran. In Surah 75, 19, 18 and 19, once we recite it, you shall follow such a Quran, then it is we who will explain it. But God has a system, and God says we, when God uses the plural tense in the Quran, we know that other entities are involved. Other entities can be the angels, human messengers. So God's system is that he, he sends messengers. So 5 verse 19. God's messenger of the covenant. So when God says, we will explain the Quran, God tells us how he explains the Quran. O people of the scripture, our messenger has come to you to explain things to you after a period of time without messengers, Lest you say, we did not receive any preacher or warner. A preacher and warner has now come to you. God is omnipotent. So in case it wasn't clear enough that God sent a, a scripture with the details of everything, God picks one of us to cut through all those false interpretations um, and opinions and to deliver God's judgment to us on every important issue. So God is eliminating every excuse. If you think about it, one analogy of this is that, you know, God paved a road for us, and he calls it a straight road, to tell us where to go. God gave us the Quran as a map and said, hey, in case this road is confusing to you, even though it's perfectly straight, here's a map, okay? If you take an exit, this map will guide you back to this straight path. And if that wasn't enough, he sent somebody to come to you and hold your hand, 
okay, somebody like you, a human being, to walk you down this road, okay, to bring you home. So if you had a map and a straight road, and you, and you had a, and God sent somebody to walk you home, and you didn't show up, what would you say? This was just too confusing. It was difficult, you know? You wouldn't say that. You'd have no one to blame but yourself. That's the situation we're in as human beings. And this is why. So even though God made everything easy, God calls the Quran Sijin and Elayin. Uh, Sijin and Elayin are numerically structured books. Sijin is the book of the wicked, Elayin is the book of the righteous. Both are Quran. Because we learn from the Quran that it guides the sincere believers in the right path and increases the wickedness of the, of the insincere. That's one of the functions of the Quran. The Quran wasn't sent down just to guide the believers. It was sent down to send the disbelievers astray and increase their wickedness. So, so when we talk about Sijin and Elayin, what we're saying is God guides the sincere to that clear, simple, easy-to-learn scripture, and God blocks out the insincere. So no matter how easy it is or how straight that road is, no matter who he sends to hold your hand and walk you down that path, um, if you're not sincere, you'll be blocked out. So God said... He prevents the disbelievers from understanding it, and he talks about Abraham, and he says, we granted him his understanding. So, just want to, um, let's see, finish on this one note here. What is it that determines whether you get Sejin or Elayin? How, what is it that, what's the criterion for determining if you're going to have access to the Quran or not? Okay. Is it uh, your worldly intelligence, how smart you are, how many PhDs you have? Um, is, it, is it your knowledge? Is it, even your, is it even your Quranic knowledge? Have you thought about that? Is it even your Quranic knowledge? 4523 says no, it's not. God says, have you noted the one whose God is his ego? Consequently, God sends him astray despite his knowledge. Um, is it your money? Is it your race, your looks, your nationality? No, it's not. 3437, it is not your money or your children that bring you closer to us. The answer is, is only one thing, and that is no personal opinion, no interpretation, no inventing. It's, uh, it's unhesitating submission to God. That's it. If you're willing to accept whatever God gave you in the form that he decreed it for you, okay, in, his, in, in accordance with his system, and you submit to God unhesitatingly, you'll have the true Quran. The Quran will be easy to understand. It'll be clear. There will be no ambiguity in it for you. Because we learn that our job is not to perfect God's system or to improve upon his message, okay? Our job is to work on ourselves. We are the ones that have the impurities. God's system is perfect and pure. And he made a covenant with us that if we do our part, God will do his part. Our part is not to come and... Uh, improve upon, God forbid, God's system and his message. That's called innovation. Our part is to fix ourselves, accept what he gives us unhesitatingly, and submit wholeheartedly. So submission to God, unhesitating submission, total submission, total devotion, coming to God wholeheartedly. These are repeated throughout the Quran, and, um, and these are the, this is the criterion for determining whether you get access to this simple to understand and straightforward book or not. So 
The last thing I want to read is a quick excerpt from Appendix 20. It says, God uses his own attributes to describe the Quran. Okay, this is, this is actually mind-blowing. You think about this, um, and it makes you, it just leaves you in awe. He calls the Quran Azim, great, 1587. Hakim, full of wisdom, 36.2. Majid, glorious, 51. And Karim, honorable, 56.77. What can we say? And the last verse is what, you, what I have posted up here. God says, if we revealed this Quran to a mountain, you would see it trembling, crumbling out of reverence for God. We cite these examples for the people that they may reflect. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ali Reza. Um, we'll take some questions now. I'm sorry, what is your name? Okay. Uh, Salam alaikum, everyone. Mashallah, great speech. Uh, I have a question is that when you encounter someone who says, and they read, they try to become a submitter. Uh, at least that's what they say, and they read the Quran, and they say it's very difficult to understand, and or they say it's all of talks about hell, hell, and, and you know you're going to be punished. So how do you explain it to them uh, in order to kind of encourage them, maybe to you know give it more time or whatever? You know how do you deal with that? I think one of the things that uh, is important for people to note is that it doesn't, when I say that the Quran is easy, it doesn't mean everything we read is going to immediately make sense, right? In the first time that we read it. Uh, God says we have to study the Quran cover to cover. But I would read Surah 20, verse 114, that says, Most exalted is God, the only true king. Do not rush into uttering the Quran before it is revealed to you, and say, My Lord, increase my knowledge. So um, it, we have to be patient uh, and um, you know, I think with, with patience and with imploring God for the correct understanding, we'll get there. But there's a difference between a person who says, I don't currently understand something, but I accept it whole, wholeheartedly, and I ask God to uh, grant me the correct understanding, versus somebody who doesn't understand something, and they're in opposition to it. And I think uh, the dip, that's a big difference. The, the, you know, God says in, uh, in Surah 2 that, that when you say, my mind is made up, that's a tragic statement. And the reason it's tragic is because you're actually putting a curse on yourself that prevents you from understanding the Quran for as long as you maintain that decision. So, um, so it's not so much about, like, of course, I mean, I think that's actually part of the process of being tested by the revelations is that we have to, uh, we will not understand everything right away, but we must submit to God and accept it wholeheartedly, and then God will, will reveal the understanding to us. I, I have a question about uh, what would you say to someone's criticisms about uh, someone's uh, confidence in their understanding as arrogance? They would say that your understanding is yours and mine is mine as, you know, they would be someone that you mentioned would advocate multiple interpretations. But what would you say to the criticism of you're arrogant to say that you have such confidence in your understanding. Yeah, I think, I think that's part of it. So there's two issues there, right? One is like, maybe I am arrogant, okay? Like, God forgive me, but does that mean that I'm wrong? So I think um, uh, the, 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 the bigger issue is that, that we cannot imply, there's a lot of people who imply that anybody who, um, who believes with confidence and certainty in anything is arrogant, and I think that's, that's just ego, you know? How could you know something for sure? You know, I have to accept the fact that there's people who are more knowledgeable than me and that God may have revealed certain things to them that I haven't, uh, that I haven't come to understand yet. But, um, but, you know, I think, so I think it depends. I mean, my answer is like, yeah, we have to be careful not to um, present the information as if we are um, infallible. I mean, we all have the, we all, we, ca we can all make mistakes. You know, we have to be open. We have to consult with one another the way God says. And we shouldn't be uh, arrogant in the way we deliver it. 
But um, that doesn't give any credence to the argument that, you know, saying that you know something for sure is an arrogant thing, because that's not true. Otherwise, all of the righteous people who God tells us in the Quran have reached certainty about his revelations were arrogant people, which makes no sense. So. Okay, uh, so we take one last question, and I'm sorry, we, we, we're not taking any more questions. First, it was next person, so I'll let you speak, and we'll move on to the next speaker, Godwin. Ali John, how do you define wholeheartedly? I think, I mean, that to me, it, um, coming to God with your whole heart, um, that's the reason I read so many different, like, I guess, quotes from the Quran that describe, they, I think they describe the same char characteristic, right? One, um, a couple places it says that, like, for example, Abraham came to his Lord wholeheartedly. There's other verses that say that the believers must submit a total submission. Um, there's other verses that talk about being sincere or, uh, you know, these are all, I think, uh, synonyms in a sense. They're describing a person who, um, who has accepted God's absolute authority, which means that I may not understand everything right off the bat, but I accept it because I know that this is the proven word of God. And then, I am, and then I implore God to grant me the understanding, as opposed to somebody who says, I won't accept it until I understand it. And I think that's a person who, um, in many cases, will end up worshiping their ego because, um, because uh, you know, God has an opinion, by the way, and we have opinions. If we uphold our opinion instead of God's opinion, that's called idol worship. Um, so that, that's the way I, I understand uh, wholeheartedly is not having an opinion independent of God's opinion. So.